morning or good afternoon. Welcome again to Hydration Lecture Series. I have the great pleasure to have today uh, Dr. Jody Stuckey with us, uh, who is a hydration expert. And uh, she's coming more from the area of uh, nutritional epidemiology, and I'm really uh, very happy that you are here after a very difficult journey, I would say, last night. And uh, we all look forward to hear to your presentation. Thank you, John. Okay, Th thank you very much for having me. Um, yesterday really brought home to me how important, how special it is to get to have these moments where we're all together and through, because I nearly didn't make it and I would have been really disappointed. Um, so I've come all this way to talk about cell hydration, epidemiology, and healthy children. And this is a very broad topic, and I'm just going to be giving a, a overview, skimming this topic, and it's going to be totally from my point of view. So, other people will have other points of view. Uh, I'm supposed to recommend, if you have questions. Yes, sorry. yes okay. Uh, <laughs> Hydration lectures at gmail.com. Okay. My point of view is coming from nutrition. I work on hydration. Um, uh, to know how it's going to impact population. There are other points of view in physiology and nephrology, biochemistry, cell biology. In many different disciplines, there are people with so clinical studies in individuals, in vitro studies in cells. And the, the key question for hydration epidemiology is really are we working together? Is the cell hydration data aligning to impact which health? So I'm going to very briefly talk about these things, hydration, measurement, what we know about prevalence, determinants, acute outcomes, chronic outcomes, public health recommendations, gaps in knowledge. And the arc for this talk is going to be a bit like this. Well, here we have a challenge. Let's think about whether or not we can do something about it. Yeah, that's way too complicated. <laughs> I think we'll give up. But in a minute, maybe there's something we can do, reconsider, and okay, let's. So we'll start with defining cell hydration. When we think about cells, think about life and water. We have to huh? Is it too much, right? Too little. We're thinking in terms of cell hydration for human population. In vacuum, it we you know hydration is a function of extracellular and intracellular We can think in terms of, is it, we have, we can think relative ratios relative to body weight or Hydration is related to but not the same as total body hydration. And so here's an example of different kinds of uh, body water distribution for an individual. And the top one is the situation of normal conditions. And the middle three are cases where we can lose body water at the same as the water. And the bottom one is a situation where we lose cell water without it. And we know that cell hydration, oh, I wanted to say something back about this. That these cases in the middle, of the BCND, and uh, they can conceivably happen in people in life because every night we have a period of water restriction, not drinking water, and losing water and breathing. So this can happen day. In the bottom uh, pattern E, we can also have that. We have a community for that day when we eat. So the food and the hormones we distribute the water out of the cell. So, hydration varies as a function of solute and in water body, all of the solute in and out of cells. And this makes it different, again, from total body hydration because for total body water, that where we're believing is staying stable to within 0.2% body weight over time for health. And the stability is a good thing, but for cell hydration, the variation is the good thing. So they're very different in that respect. 
we we know that changes in cell volume have a lot of functional significance, and and this is a review by Lang and his group that that's a great entryway in finding out what the cell uses for different parts of the For example, uh, the changes in cell volume are really how we think in our on cells have to swell when they're activated, that's what's producing the signal. When the body concentrates up, the change in patients releasing and, and, and include metabolizing macronutrients, consuming oxygen, Immunity change, swelling and shrinking of the same stuff. That up thinking you get less dysfunction. So this thing is well and the engine I this spot in a human just an example of sodium and the same water goes. We that these defense what as cute really this is very big is the accumulation of water. Hydration is defended by hormone release. So the shrink that triggers release of anti And at the individual level, we can see the volume constant of patients advanced diabetes. And then we also see at the individual level that signaling the kidney to concentrate urine and they produce a bit. So, as you can think of in terms of measurement, it's possible at the first week to intercellular ratio, so the shrinking swelling, the osmotic gradient, what is the gradient, maybe some of the responses of shrinkage, which is maybe just point of view of these would be immediate. And then that would likely be different from the acute. So and what is not on the left at point is total body work. And so I'm going to be focusing on urine situation. And the reason for that of all the directives we can go right now, urine concentration is really the only one that we can fairly sure it size that the cells were shrinking. The cells shrink, they trigger the hormone, and they produce the urine. We don't really have that same kind of inference you can get from uh, isotope dilution, the action potential. Or even a, a given serum loss, if I tell you 290, change with urine concentration uh, these are some data from a study of individual children that we brought them into our clinic and for the midday and just an they got to and we gave them drinking water three stages in 60 minutes. It so this is just a great investigation. Great stuff. Thank you. For the investigation. This is 
is both naked and your kids are protected. This is similar to you see in adults. Data here on the right are Perrier et al. And they show several days of fluctuation in adults. And that this brings up the question, what does do to, to measure usual urinalality if it keeps changing? Well, then you have to remember, I have this slide because uh, the usual response to that, well, how do we do usual? Let's just do 24-hour urine. We'll just look. Okay. But you have to, uh, we have to do a 24-hour urine. You won't pick it. And then you don't get population representative. Oh, we think, well, let's try collecting one sample on multiple days. And we have to estimate how many days we need then to get a true useful status. And so if we take the data, living children, in this case, in 15 children, if we did that, we need seven days to get their usual status. Maybe what this NHANE sample we have more rankings and so it makes it worse. We need 30 days to get the usual and if I think kids, obese kids, that fucking night urine. There you there it's looking good, you can get it one. But that's really tough us about the status at night, and we're missing all that variation during the day. So we get back, get this, this fluctuation, fluctuating pattern again, and we think, well, maybe really all we need to know is, is somebody up here versus down there? Just dichotomize it. So I tried that with some data on your osmolality over eight weeks. These children were all on a standardized and down on the bottom it, um, is the distribution of urine osmolality. This week, four of six are not so two hundred. Distribution. So forty percent of the kids this week had a urine osmolality between eight and and if we look with the spirit bank correlation at bank kids, would we get the same answer as what kids will find? Not really. The best correlations were in the fifth drop. Everyone was supposed to do the same thing for eight weeks, and this is what we got. So then I thought, well, what does it look like? If we know that one every single week, and we have three people, eight weeks. But if we had to use the sample six, we would and we would think we had so we'd be basically missed So. In terms of uh, my my, I'm trying to measure the hydration status to find out if there's just an effect of health, and I'm particularly interested in chronic disease. They look at your is truly related to the chronic disease. Do not have these. So the kids with kids with ten times more likely to get this example. We'd misclassify. We would misclassify did it with the uh year it would change this place and if we did them we would have the eight. So basically we would go from seeing a super strong effect to no effect at all. Only using that one. But 
tot should be serious by such of. So we saw well, this is pretty good because it's telling makes sense. No, he said the kids are probably able to do it, so we're feeling positive. And then we need a measure that we can use to study a large group of people who are at risk of some kind of exposure over time. So we want ideally to know if they're exposed and then follow them and then find out if they experience these outcomes. Because chronic disease outcomes are fairly rare, then you have to start out with a lot of people so that you end up with enough numbers to study. So this is the problem that we're working to solve. And some, some very friendly mentors in the well, why do this? Why, you know, why do all this work? And you can just use some frozen samples if someone else is collecting The top that you ever know is about the acid fetch urine. That help. It was pretty tough to get by it. And when you think, I mean, just can't do it. <laughs> so this is what has started to be adapted to, to try and find. Wow. Well, so you just end up in preparing. But did do a develop a black mark. But is it me for me? Because today, it's good things is for to work to friends. It's me to come to a lot of people to work on hydration and do something. Um, hope we can ask different kinds of markers and we'll get some. So, let's think about what what all the measures on individuals, but what well, just measure the group of individuals. So, if you look at the same data, what you see is that each week over half of this group of kids have turned up quality over 800 over two months. So, even though we're not getting very good data at the individual level, at least we get the same answer. For whole group. In any given week, the group as a whole has the best rated. So that's moving us now to hydration. And there's a group in Germany that's been using about hydration groups. And they've written great review with some data that can be And here, osmolalities for British children, and down here are the urine osmolalities for the African children. And they report some means by age and place in the paper, and you can see that they're definitely. The mean suggests that half, if you assume that it's distributed, if half is the healthy British children have quite half quality. But also in review, they should if it's on the UK, Israel, and Japan, you get the same answer half of the healthy children in the different countries have a year in the last week, over 750 grams. Half of the The is the energy of what prevalence, not me, in 3% of the children. And they broke it down into population, and they grouped to the same age and in season. Higher, the Jewish and in for if I set here you your quality boys girls 
And then here we have data. This is showing us that about 60% of the U.S. is thinking how that data is here. And down here, very few of even the cake is up to this level. You don't see the same, uh, any differences by age, more or less 60%. And then this is a very important data set, the, the, one of the main data sets used for our dietary recommendations. And so I'm going to show you the methods we're using to get the urine optimality. They collected urine for children 6 to 19 and doing for the afternoon, whatever was being it. And they were collecting the urine to do pregnancy testing and, and many biomark tests. And in this particular year, it was they were going to use the urine optimality to correct and adjust for concentration for the answer. If they were, the children were 12 or older and they had a morning visit, they were told to fast for nine hours. And if they were unable to void, they were given a glass of water and asked to retry and void up to three times before the, the clinic measurement finished. So it's hard to know because you can't really say this is pre-living and how, how they were without the intervention because give them a glass of water and they diluted it. If you tell them to fast, some people think that means don't drink any either and you may be Also, this urine osmolality was collected that year. Not every, it's not collected every year. We don't have annual monitoring at the national level for um, urine osmolality. So in this period, 2009 to 2014, there were a series of studies done that were inspired by the data from Israel. And it's the same uh, that's used. It, we all collected um, I did from New York. But this, you're, you're, without telling the kids anything, don't just do on the view on the class. These studies in Egypt, UK, France, and Italy were done, and we won't get the same number kids, but 60% to have a urine osmolality of 800. And there's a little bit of a range between 57 and 67. Maybe we will work. In, the, in these six days, we do see some of the difference of the not in the Step two. Tropical, lower They suggest that they should look at food intake being in Germany. The Created children can see more water beverages and water supplies. And in Israel, they take the evidence. Or maybe they have to be training the activity. Maybe that. My in, in old and involuntary dehydration because the kids. These kids I've been telling you about can you <laughs> group that I bring you here. And we can do it because did the case gave you class to do it. So we had some the kids who did it, they drank more, they diluted the beer and off the body, and they were really thirsty. But then over time they started to report more thirst even though the beer and coffee. 
They have this other bitch that just didn't drink it. No. As a
form convenience. This is just kind of we might look high. It's pretty depressing. The mushrooms aren't very good. So I'm showing you what you know, I showed you this kid trying to make the effect with us group of children. Basically we don't have studies that are focusing on your not to see it. The problem is if you're gonna do this kind of study, you would need to have many events of your analysis quality of time. And it's good difficult to track and think of your the group level. And you're putting your data in the model, it's not full groups. And then maybe study. Also, I wanted to remember to say that uh, in these studies, you comparing to what? In this case, these kids were below five, and it may be a single of not between six and eight. It may be just. Of course, I don't see it yet. Anyway. Health, health recommendations were for cell hydration. Our USBRI uses these hydration. If you look at the tables in the DX, here. Putting you in the attic of what using the potential we saw you with it is it's just this with an equation. So they're not keeping what dietary intake. They are for this idea about cell hydration in your body. They say it appears to be the basic calculation of the kidney. Top recommended to be you probably at the top five. So we stay thinking of this and we just have to find this for a bit. Gap to knowledge. We don't have an interdisciplinary consensus on cell hydration of what we should should we all be trying to measure cell shrinkage or inability to shrink and swell optimally? We don't have one point in time measure for individual chronic cell hydration. We don't have systematic monitoring of cell hydration. We have a lack of data. Data. Dehydration. You know, I'm cute, cute effect. You know, oh yeah, yeah. Using serum quality as an index, our public health follow first. Any of the bridges. We have a tiny bit of if we're trying to get a line to pop it, just a little bit of amazing at the individual on the effects based on. And if we were to follow this, we would say that we need a minimum like clean water and that's just what itself. So that would make a different kind of situation. And we have to the problem. So in summary, I'm trying to be more positive with my well, <laughs> We know that hydration is distinct from hot water and that's really required. It is our function. It's, it's the cell thing. Um, what is speaking to be with you help 
quality, the determinants, the patients that Mickey and talk very dehydration are, in, are important for this group of children. This is cute. Oh, this function is just a practice.
is that their quality. Yeah. Well, yeah. Time we've measured it, it's already been compensated for. And that's the problem here. Well, the, lot, the range is so small, and the osmotic telling us within plus minus five. So the 292 to 294 outer point matter, we can tell where we're looking at it. I think it's osmotic driven based on I bet here I'm not a physiologist. Oh, we need a physiologist to come and do this. For I think that the stuff to all have the same on. You have to have the same osmolality. But in a way that can't be because we have level of analysis but apply a more rigorous study design, maybe higher up modeling or different kinds of models to take advantage of the data as aggregate instead of yeah. We basically just took the meaning of the Right, we have to translate that to something they can see, and which we can do because everyone sees their go to bath every day. Look. Water cake? No. For the eight week study? No, it was too onerous on them. I got them to do a log record so I knew if they were eating more or less, not how much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm J.D. Adams. I'm working on my PhD in exercise science here at the University of Arkansas. Exercise science, simply put, is understanding how to maximize the body's health and performance. I'm interested in the science of heat and hydration 
in both healthy people and people with medical conditions. Let me show you what students and faculty are studying in the Hume Performance Laboratory at the U of A. Concussions are a serious concern for athletes of all ages. Dr. R.J. Elbin studies the neurocognitive, physical, and psychosocial effects of sport-related concussion in youth and college-age athletes. His research focuses on identifying factors that influence concussion risk and recovery. Whoa! Dr. Michelle Gray does research on functional fitness to help older adults live independently as long as possible. She studies muscular power, an aspect of fitness that gets to the heart of the matter. Maintaining adequate muscular power helps prevent fall injuries, the leading cause of both fatal and non-fatal injuries among older adults. Well, how'd I do? JD, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is you survived the test. The bad news is the worst reading we've ever seen. Man, I need to work on my core strength. Dr. Barry Brown created this device called the Ab Test to quantify core strength. His research has shown that sit-ups measure abdominal muscle endurance, not strength. Building the core reduces lower back pain and enhances athletic performance. Wow, there's some fascinating stuff in here. Diabetes begins with insulin resistance in the skeletal muscle. Dr. Nicholas Green is researching how we can use exercise to combat those effects. His research is working toward ways we can prevent diabetes and related diseases or lessen their severity. Dr. Tyrone Washington's research focuses on how different physiological conditions, such as obesity and aging, affect muscles' ability to recover from damage. <sighs> Nothing like water to quench your thirst, but too little water can have a big impact on a person's health, exercise performance, and cognitive function. By artificially inducing thirst and monitoring the body's response, Dr. Stavros Kavaris shows that even small degrees of dehydration can also affect kidney function, glucose metabolism, and hormonal changes. Man, this suit is hot, but researchers use it to study body temperature control. Dr. Matthew Ganio's research focus is on understanding how hydration and heat stress affect people with medical conditions such as diabetes and obesity. The findings from this research have implications for how to improve long-term cardiovascular health. Man, it's hot in there. But Dr. Brendan McDermott needs a heat chamber like this to do research on prevention and treatment of exertional heat stroke and hydration status in athletes. His studies can have profound benefits not only for athletes, but also people such as soldiers and those who work in extreme weather conditions. Well, what do you think? Pretty cool stuff, huh? Many of our graduates go on to work in clinical, sport, and academic settings. If any of this interests you, visit our website. You can be a part of the important research going on to help people live healthier lives. We look forward to hearing from you.